Praise cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I praise cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. So much we have lost as we look down the road where all the prodigals have walked. And one by one, the enemy has whispered lies and led them on the slaves. But we know that you are God, yours is the victory. There is more to come that we may not yet see. So with the faith you've given us, we step into the valley unafraid.
breath of God, now breathe, oh breath of God, breathe, oh breath of God, now breathe, breathe, oh breath of God, now breathe, oh breath of God. breath of God. Now breathe, oh breath of God. Breathe, oh breath of God. Now breathe. Breathe, oh breath of God. Now breathe, oh breath of God. Breathe, oh breath of God. Now breathe. We call to dry bones come alive come alive we call out to dead hearts come alive come alive up out of the ashes let us sin on the rise we call out to dry bones come alive we Call out to dry bones, come alive. We call out to dry bones, come alive. I want to share a word with you. Wednesday night, Gracie's husband, um, Tony, who I thought was 82 years old, but he's 89. And so, <laughs> and if you know Tony, he looks like he's about 65 years old, 89. And so I, we're talking and we're just talking about, because one of the um, people in church needed someone who just came up from Venezuela, they needed a job. And so Tony was overhearing and, and he's like, oh, I have work for you. And I'm looking at him like, He's like, I work here. I do remodels. I build decks and whatever. And I'm like, looking at this man who I think is 82. And I'm like, how, how, how old are you? He's like, I'll be 89 in December. And I'm like, and you're building decks and you're in attics and you're doing all these things. I'm like, what do you eat? And he said, he's like, I eat everything. I eat pizza. I eat cake. I eat it all. And I'm like, so then like, what kind of vitamins do you take? He's like, the will to live. jaw dropped. Think about that. He goes, it's the will to live. That is what has 
kept him and Jesus, but the will to live for Jesus. Then the next morning I was praying and the Lord said, I just, I thought about that, that he brought that to my remembrance. I was thinking about it again and I'm like, okay, like, I'm like, that's really just so profound, God. Like the will to live, like, let me just like carry that same spirit to you for, for you. And then I thought about America and I was like, wow. I'm like, God, America, they live to die. Americans in American culture, even in the world, people live to die. They go through this cycle of, you know, being born, adolescent, bearing children, having a family, you know, moving on. And then they, like, everybody's looking forward to retirement. But as Christians, the Lord was like, Dina, we're to live to live because we never die because we have eternal life with Jesus. In Jesus, in, with Jesus. We have, we live to live because the moment we leave this earth, we step right into eternity. It's like it doesn't even skip a beat when we know Jesus. And so I don't know where you're at today, but if your bones are feeling dry, if you don't have the will, <laughs> you align everything so perfect, Lord. <laughs> Let him breathe. Let him breathe on you. Let him breathe on those dry places. Let him breathe on those places that where you're downcast. Let him breathe on the places where you're tired. Let him breathe on the places where you're feeling depressed, where you're feeling sad. Let him breathe on the places where you're feeling depleted. Let him breathe. Let the breath of God, because he's the only thing. He is the only thing. Not the world, not things, not possessions, not people, but God, the Holy Spirit. He's the only thing that can breathe life into those bones. And I think we can all learn, especially me, Lord. I want to live to live. I want to live to live, Lord, until the day that you call me home and I step over into my eternal dwelling place with you, God. Breathe on us. Let us not be stagnant, Lord. When the wind is blowing, nothing can be stagnant. When the wind is blowing, things move. Things move. And so breathe, God, so that we would not remain stagnant. As Christians, God, I, as Christians, God, let breathe on us, Lord, that we would advocate for the things that matter in this world, God. There are people that you have raised up, God, to write letters to the Senate. There are people that you raised up to, to advocate for, for pro-life with love, not with condemnation, but with love. You have raised people up to do it, Lord. So breathe on them, God. Breathe on them, God. Thank you, God. You'll do it, God. You'll do it, God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Let's sing this song again. Hallelujah. Just the um, chorus. Thank you.
Your love, your love is matchless, oh God, there's none like you. There's no other love like yours, oh God. When we're hurting, God, you are our comforter, God. There's no other love like yours.
Beloved, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
disciples came around to Jesus and they asked him a question, Lord, would you teach us how to pray? They could have asked the Lord anything in that moment. They simply said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he gave them a prayer model. And the model went like this. Let's repeat it together. Our Father, this day our daily bread place to uproot but in him all things are possible so if there's any unforgiveness in your heart towards any person an old boss a previous relationship you should ask the Lord right now to forgive you let the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse you from all sin God is so great that he provides a way of escape. Would you just give praise to the Lord right now for the escape route he gave you? That you didn't fall into temptation. You didn't give over to the day of evil. Come on, somebody just shout hallelujah in this house. Thank you, Lord. And here's why. Because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever 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 and everybody in this house said amen and amen Lord right now we hold in our hand God an important meal the meal that you sat down with your disciples in an upper room bread after supper time you said this is your body that has been given to us let us do this in remembrance of you we thank you Lord that in that same setting you raised a cup you said in this cup is the new covenant in my blood we want to thank you God for sending your son in a body form just like us we want to thank you that he overcame by remaining sinless on this earth. The spotless lamb 
slain from the foundation of the world. We thank you that in you we have the victory. We thank you for the shedding of your blood today that assures us that we have been atoned for on the cross. We have been purchased, bought back, ransomed without a cost. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the forgiveness in this room. We thank you for the healing in this room. We thank you for the deliverance in this room. And most importantly, we thank you for the saving that you've done in this room. Come on, if you're saved in the house of the Lord, shout amen right now and amen and amen. And let's partake together as a family in Jesus' name. Welcome to First Assembly this morning. Welcome. Lord. How's everyone doing today? Good? Blessed and highly favored? Good. We get a couple of announcements in this morning before we get to the preaching of the word. I'll ask you to hold off on your tithe and your offering until the end of service. Okay, number one, uh, typically we have our monthly prayer and uh, praise service once a month right here in the sanctuary, but this month we're going to connect with uh, Undivided Move the Earth prayer. It's going to be over at Calvary Lighthouse in Lakewood, all right? Um, I just want to just praise the house because we have shown up in great power on a quarterly basis this year, and uh, I'm proud of you. Two things move my heart the most is attendance on Wednesday and prayer. Come out to pray. If you can get people to come out and pray, you have a successful church. Prayer is what builds the house. Amen? So come on out. Uh, Calvary Lighthouse, Lakewood, 6 o'clock. We'll, we'll begin prayer and worship. Uh, collectively, we're about 11, 13 churches in the area. It's going to be a great night of prayer and worship. Amen? All right, two more announcements that I won't do. I'm going to ask Alicia to come, and then Jay, you can come right behind her and announce what's going on. Yay. Good morning. Um, first of all, I apologize. I cried my eyes out a minute ago, so. <laughs> Plenty of tissues go around the house, right? Um, okay, so those of you who haven't heard yet, we are doing an outreach event um, in Lakewood, October 7th three to six, um, really feel like the Lord is asking us to step outside of this church Amen. and really just get out there in the community. It's becoming more and more important to show that love of Jesus to the people who don't know that love. Um, so we're hoping, even if you don't want to volunteer, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Um, if you don't want to volunteer your time to do a game or serve food or any of the other things that they're specifically in need of, um, just to come out and be the light and be the love. Um, part of my vision was to open the event with just worship. Um, so I just, I when I saw the location, I saw the tent that we're going to have. It's a big white tent. And I just saw people all around it in worship. And I'm going to cry again. Come on, Lord. <sighs> so... I would just love to see all of your hands in the air that day. So again, October 7th, 3 to 6, um, sign-up sheets in the back. There's also flyers on the table in the entryway. So thank you, and hope to see you all there. Amen. 
Awesome. If you don't sign up, we're sending Jimmy to your house. <laughs> and they'll make sure that you do. No, I'm just kidding. Good morning. How's everyone doing? So I got a quick announcement um, for the men. So men, we're doing a men's conference here at church November 4th. So I think we had a mark your calendar, save the date announcement already, but this one to, to really encourage you. So every man that's in this room, I really want you to pray about coming out to attend this conference. Not just pray for yourself, but pray for the Lord to show you to bring someone that needs to be here as well. So we're going to have, we've got a, a jam-packed uh, time. You know, we're going to have between 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock that day. We've got four amazing speakers. We're going to have small group discussions, breakout sessions. We're going to have a uh, discussion panel. God's really going to move in this conference. And um, the conference is, is themed Arise. And the theme is based on, you know, there's a call to action for us men. There's a call to action for us to rise up and to call, to answer the call that the Lord has given us. So each one of you have a call. You, you may know your call right now. You may not know your call. Mm. But God has called you. There's something that he's birthed inside of you that he wants to come alive. So he wants you to rise up and be the man that he's called you to be. Be the man that he's called you to be in your house, in your community, at your job. But come on out, man. It's, it's something you don't want to miss. I encourage you to sign up. There's going to be a sign-up sheet in the back. It's $25. Just covers the lunch, and we're going to have a small uh, breakfast in the morning. But come on out. You don't want to miss it. Amen. Amen. Good stuff. Praise the Lord. I'll give you the most important announcement now according to the word of the Lord. Amen. If you're to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 19. We're going to start a new series this morning. I want to pull you into a journey into the supernatural. I want you to look at your neighbor and tell them that they're super. Try to do it without laughing. Tell them that they're super. And I want you to turn to your other neighbor and tell them that they're natural. <laughs> How many of you believe in the power of the Holy Ghost? Show of hands. Okay, everybody in the house, we're in good company. Amen. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We hear a lot of sermons preached about God the Father, God the Son. We sing songs about the Father. We sing songs about the Son. We talk about the love of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, the grace of God. I want to just talk to you for the next several weeks about the raw power of God. Will that be okay? We're headed into an interesting season. A lot of different spirits come out around this time of year. Uh, I would have you to know that witchcraft is one of the fastest growing religions in the United States. Um, and so we need the power of God to dispel darkness. The power of God to come on the ordinary and make it extraordinary. This is really what the power of God is all about. The third person of the Trinity that we call the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And what he desires to do is bring out of you signs, wonders, and miracles. I didn't hear too many Holy Spirit filled people in the house say amen. The Bible says, I'll remind you, call upon me and I will show you great and mighty things. Um, and so I believe that hell is going to know who you are when we get done with this. I'm going to show you a verse in scripture this morning that will actually speak to that. Um, I want you out of your mouth say, hell, you will know who I am. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? That all of hell would know who you are. Amen. Acts 19, we're going to read 
20 verses of Scripture. I have about 40 to cover this morning. I want you to know that Christian living is supernatural or it's nothing. Write that down. Christian living is supernatural or it's nothing. The church as we know it, is made up of living stones built into a spiritual house. Can you say amen? Spiritual is the opposite of merely natural. Okay? It means inhabited and guided and empowered by the supernatural Holy Spirit of God. Paul makes a distinction in the scriptures where he tells us the natural person and the spiritual person. Can you say amen? And he describes those people, those individuals, as natural persons, as mere humans. How would you like just to walk around life just being a mere human being? I spent 25 years of my life being a mere human being. Until the supernatural got a hold of the natural, I became a supernatural being. Can you say amen? And so I want you to understand that you are not superhuman. You are a spiritual human. I want you to tell your neighbor, I'm a spiritual human. I'm not a superhero. There is no way that we can be the church without this experience. There is no way. All we would be is an organization, a religious sect. Something along those lines. We wouldn't be a church without this distinction happening in our life. There's a call in your life to deny yourself for the sake of the love of Christ operating through you. It's his love that wants to burst forth through your very being. And it doesn't really matter. You could be doing it for... Five years. How many in this house have walked with the Lord for uh, five years? You're in like your five year, one to five years. Anybody? One, two, three, four, five. Good. How many of you have walked with the Lord for ten years? One to ten years. Good. How about 15? One to 15 years. One to 30? Up to 30, up to 50. How many of you walk with the Lord 50 years? Look at the hands. Okay? What this tells me is that we're a teaching church. Doesn't matter if you are a newborn Christian walking with the Lord at a very young age, or if you are a a seasoned Christian, you've walked with the Lord for 50 years. All of us are going to encounter the power of God in a unique way over these next couple of weeks. Every single person. It doesn't matter if you're 15 or if you're 85. The power of God wants to come through your life. Can you say amen? Amen. All right. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 1.8, Do not be ashamed then of testifying to our Lord, but share in suffering for the gospel in the power of God. Paul writes to the Colossians, for this I toil to present everyone mature in Christ, striving with all the energy, all the energy which he mightily inspires within me. So it's not energy that you and I muster up. It's energy that God gives us through the power of his Holy Spirit to be able to communicate the good news to those that are around us. Many of you know I can do all things in him who gives me the strength. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because we know it is God that's working within us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's not even for your good, it's for his good. Come on, somebody. Paul again says in Ephesians, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. If one of these verses just sticks out to you, grab a hold of it. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, I will all the more gladly boast of my weakness that the power of Christ 
may rest upon him. Come on, somebody. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that's within me. My God. One more. Romans 15, 18. For I will not venture to speak of anything except where Christ has taught through me to win obedience from the Gentiles by word and by deed. Holy Spirit, right now, close your eyes. I'm available for you to allow your power to increase in my life. I pray, God, that I would operate in the supernatural, in this natural body, that you would allow the supernatural power of God to touch the world that's around me. I'm asking you right now to give us ears to listen, hearts to receive, and bodies that will be mobilized in this next season of life. We expect a great harvest for your glory, for your kingdom, and for your power to be on display in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I prepared way too much for today. But this is how we start out series. I'm going to lay a good foundation for you, and then we're going to get deeper as the weeks go on. There's 40 verses of scripture. Uh, 40 verses of scripture that I have pulled out just for today. We're going to read 20 verses right now. Get a good dose of the word. All right? Listen to this. Listen carefully to how Paul describes what's about to take place. The Bible says, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. I think one of the greatest tragedies in the American church is that we leave the Holy Spirit out of the church. You can walk into church and say, where's the Holy Spirit? If you do that, if you walk into a place and say, where is the Holy Spirit? You should pick your things up and exit back where you came in. They're like, what are you talking about? What is this Holy Spirit that you're talking about? So they said to him. We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said back to them, into what then were you even baptized? So they said, um, into John's baptism. Remember John's baptism was a baptism of what? Repentance. Right? Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, say, I'm hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid their hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues, and they prophesied. Man. Now the men were about 12 in all. Interesting. Where have we seen that before? When Jesus was here. And then he went into the synagogue and he spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, when we start talking about the raw power of the Holy Spirit, there are going to be people that do not believe what they are going to see. But spoke, here's, here's the kicker. But then they, what did they do? They spoke evil. They spoke evil of the way. So it wasn't even against Paul. It was against of the way. See the capital W there? The way. Who is the way? Who is the way, the truth, and the life? Who are they really coming against? Jesus. The teachings of Jesus. 
the way of the New Testament church was coming in with raw power through the Holy Spirit. They were coming against the way. My God. Are you getting this? Before the multitude, he departed from them, and then he withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannius. He spent about three years in the school of Tyrannius. Paul's like, listen, I got to get away, and I got to get deeper into my study. I'm going to take you on a path to understanding that in just a minute. But sometimes when evil is coming against you and you don't know how to respond, you have to get away and study just a little bit more intently about the kingdom of God. So he did that. He went away, became a student of the word in the school of Tyrannius, and he, he dove into study. It's okay to have a devotional life. Everybody in this room should have a devotional life, but you have to take your devotional life into a study. There's a difference. All right, let's continue. And this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia, so we know where he was, Heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now God worked unusual. Watch this. Now, after all that time that he spent, now God's going to operate in raw power. Say raw power. raw power. This is where the supernatural is really going to start taking off in extraordinary ways. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Everybody in this house should be saying amen. amen. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists haha, took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Come on, somebody. You see the shift that's happened? Everything that was coming against Paul is now shifted back in his favor because of his faithfulness to the Lord. My God. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva. No problem for the raw power of God. A Jewish chief priest, and they did it as well. And the evil spirit answers. Now they start talking. And said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? I opened up and I told you, hell is going to know who you are. <laughs> then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all the Jews and the Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus, watch this, was magnified. So the signs, the wonders, and the miracles are not the things we magnify. When Jesus is magnified, the signs, the wonders, and the miracles will manifest. <laughs> on somebody and many watch this not just a few and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds also many of those who had practiced magic <laughs> brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all and they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. That's a lot of money back then. 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord, watch this, grew mightily and prevailed. My goal is really twofold in ministry. Number one is this, to leave you empowered. To leave you empowered and know what you possess, to know what you possess. To get a handle on what you possess inside 
So you have to have a knowledge of what you possess and then be empowered by what you possess. I'm going to be in my element teaching this thing this morning. This is where I love to be because there's a time in church history, especially in Pentecostal circles, that people didn't know that the church service was over until everybody in the house was prayed for. That's when church was over. When every person in the house got prayed for, when they came up in the line, then you knew that church was over. And nobody left the sanctuary until that happened. Why? Because they were in awe of the raw power of God that was moving upon the souls of men and women and children. Come on, somebody. We need to get back in the 21st century, have a first century move of God. The raw power of God. The only part of the Godhead that you cannot control is the Holy Ghost. You can't control the Holy Ghost because nobody wants an uncontrolled element operating in their church services. So what has happened is churches leave the Holy Spirit out of their services, out of their order of worship. Out. Why? Because they don't want the Holy Spirit to break out because you never know what's going to happen when the Holy Spirit moves upon a body of people that are worshiping the Lord. You never know. So we'll just leave them out. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let's back up. They're called what? The synoptic gospels. Right? The teachings of Jesus. And everywhere that you see red letters, you better pay attention. Because the Son of God is speaking. Don't just scan over and say, you know, it's cute little red letters, they're a little bit different. No, there's the raw power of God that Jesus has spoken a word out of his mouth that people, us, need to hear, need to respond, and this is how we move. And everywhere throughout those Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus himself is speaking to us. Because while Jesus was here on earth, this is what he did. He chose 12 disciples. You know this. What did he call them? He called them disciples. What do we know a disciple means? A disciple means, out of the root word, it's called discipline. And here's where we're going to get a little bit deep. Until you operate in the raw power of God, you have to have a disciplined life. Can you say amen? amen. You got to be disciplined first. So Jesus spent how many years with his disciples? Three and a half years he spends with his disciples teaching them. They're observing him. They're not doing anything. They're not sent out yet. They're observing his teaching in the synagogues, watching him perform miracles. Every so often, Jesus would say, go out and just do a little bit here and a little bit there, right? They're in an observation stage right now. Why? Because they're being disciplined to know how to operate. And so we have to become disciplined as disciples of the Lord, disciplined in the word. Come on, somebody. He didn't give them power until they were disciplined. Remember that. The 12 disciples were sent into all the world to make disciples and to make a disciplined world. This is the whole purpose of it. Why do we live any way that we want to? Why do we just take grace and throw it around like a grace card and we're going to do whatever I want during the week and I'll come back Sunday and I'll make it all right because grace is there. That's not a disciplined life. A disciplined life looks different. Come on, somebody, you with me today? It's going to get good. We can't just say, ah, oh, yeah, grace just covers me. No, the Bible speaks very different. If Jesus has saved you and he lives on the inside of you, should you continue to sin? The Bible says absolutely what? Not. There should be a growth and an evolution to this walk with the Lord. Every single day we're growing and we're maturing into the things of God. There should be a, a disciplining of ourselves, both naturally and spiritually. Can anybody in this house say amen? amen? We got churches that are very disciplined, but they lack spirituality. 
You know, on the other hand, we got churches that are very spiritual and they lack discipline. How many of you know that there's a balance that we have to have between both worlds? Right? You can't just speak in tongues uh, in one side and then not obey the little things like giving. You can't. It doesn't operate like that. Right? In fact, I can get my life right spiritually. I know that I can operate naturally. Because that's the first thing we have to do. We have to get our, our spirit man aligned first so that our natural man knows how to respond. Because then you're just pulling the outer extremities in the natural world into your spirit world. And what does that do to your spirit? It intoxicates your spirit. So the Bible says, you know, you're going to go out into all the world. You're going to make disciplined people. That's why Acts 19 is very important. He found 12 disciples. He didn't get 13 to go, oh, yeah, I got more than Jesus did. No, he got 12, the same that he was taught to do. Right? Discipline people. Make disciplined people. We got to know when to be quiet, and we got to know when to speak. We got to know what to do. We got to know how to operate in wisdom. We got to know how to operate in excellence. We got to know how to operate in our witness. We got to know how to operate in the darkness with our light. We got to know. Come on, somebody. We got to know. We just got to know. We got to be disciplined in our approach to how we exhibit the kingdom of God on this earth. We got to know. Jesus got 12 guys together, three and a half years to disciple. Luke was a physician. Peter was a fisherman. And the list goes on and on. I want you to turn your Bibles to John 14. John 14, 19 and 20. You got to know. Say, I got to know. The Bible says, a little while longer, and the world will see me no more. There's the transition. I love it. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day, watch this, you will know. Say, I got to know. You will know. That I am in my Father, in you, in me, and I, not over you, not with you, I will be in you, my God. I'm just trying to get you to understand what you possess. Two weeks ago, I talked about Jesus Christ, Jesus the man. Christ being the anointed part of Jesus. Jesus didn't do any ministry until he was anointed, come on somebody, with the power of the Holy Spirit. At his baptism, John baptizes Jesus, Jesus comes up out of the water, and the Spirit of God in the shape of a dove descends down and says what? This is my son in whom I love. And the Spirit rested on Jesus empowering him to go into the world to do what he was sent to do. Jesus was the man. Christ was the spirit on the man. And Jesus walks into the temple and he prophetically says, I have been anointed to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted. Come on, somebody. Right? I have been sent to proclaim liberty to the captives. And the list continues on in that moment. But he was sent to die. He was sent to rise. And he was sent to ascend back to heaven. So that he would send the Holy Spirit to be with us forever. But it is as he goes back to heaven... Their job is not over. The job is continuing on right now because the Bible says that Jesus 
is now interceding for you on your behalf before the Father. Even before you pray a prayer and it leaves your mouth, the Father is hearing Jesus represent your name to him. Literally, he's sitting next to the Father. And he's interceding for you. And the intercession sounds like a rumbling before the Father. Oh God, protect them today. Father, I'm bringing, I'm bringing Mike before you today. And I'm asking you right now to not let that accident happen. I'm asking you right now. And Jesus is constantly giving intercession for you. Because how many of you know that eternity and time, you know, w when those two things collide together, <laughs> the supernatural comes. Aren't you grateful to know this morning that you have a high priest in heaven who's given intercession for you on your behalf? On your behalf. And then what he's also doing is he's holding those prayers that you do pray and you offer up from your lips in bowls before the throne room. And he's going, now's the time I answer that prayer. Now is the time that answer to prayer comes. If it's a yes, if it's a no, if it's a wait, if it's clarity, if it's wisdom, if it's direction, whatever it is, he is right there with that bowl of prayer requests that you offer up to him. Yes, it's your laundry list. You know the laundry list that we give to him every day, oh God. Right? He hears those. Every prayer that you pray is like incense burning in the throne room. Come on, somebody. Outside of praying in Jesus' name, there's no way. There's no truth and there's no life. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. And Jesus is the life. You can't pray th through Buddha. You can't pray through Muhammad. Although those are gods that are known in the world, those gods are still dead. Our God is alive. He's alive. He's resurrected. He's sitting in the, in the presence of the Father, constantly giving intercession for you and for me. So outside of praying in Jesus' name, there's no way. Because in his name, you shall raise the dead. And in his name, you shall lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. And in his name, you will cast out demons. See, I don't know about you, but I got saved in Jesus' name. I got healed in Jesus' name. I got set free in Jesus' name. I got direction in Jesus' name. I got guidance in Jesus' name. I got vision in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody with me this morning. You got something in his name. Why? Because his name is the name above Every single name, his name, sets the captives free. It's in his name. The man wasn't going to be on earth for long. So he had to be intentional about what he was going to do and how he was going to direct things. The spirit of Jesus that rested on the 120 in the upper room, come on somebody, is the same spirit that rested on the 3,000 that would get added to the church in the book of Acts. It would be the same spirit that would rest on millions and millions of people throughout church age history. It's the same spirit that's moving and operating. I'm just trying to get you to understand that he puts the super on our natural. And when we get to the book of Acts, there is a shift. And I want you to get the shift and then we'll be done. The 12 disciples become the 12 apostles. Luke writes the book of Acts, right? But he also is accredited with writing the gospel of Luke. The gospel of Luke, his words are disciples. In the book of Acts, they're called the Acts of the Apostles. He talks about his training, and then he talks about their promotion in the kingdom of God to another assignment. How many of you know that when you live a disciplined life, you can be at this level, but when Jesus puts an anointing on your life to bring you to the next level, he goes, yep, I can trust them, they're disciplined. 
So now what am I going to do? I'm going to send the Holy Spirit upon them to clothe them with a power to operate in the world. Why? Because they're disciplined. Oh my gosh, man. Acts are the acts of the apostles who are doing the same thing in the book of Acts as Jesus did when he was on the earth. Except now Jesus has gone back to be with the Father and he sends his Holy Spirit to us. These 12 men are now walking around with this power after they were disciplined. All right. Paul has always felt like an outsider. Always felt like an outsider, an outcast. All right, just give you a little bit more background. And he was trying to gain credibility with the people that he was ministering to. Previous in his, in his life, he was known to be a persecutor of Christians. No? He tries to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. He had an experience with God where God knocks him off his high horse in the book of Acts chapter 9. It's called the road to Damascus. Anybody ever have God just knock you down to the ground? You're like, oh my gosh, what just happened? What just hit me? The raw power of God just hit me in such a way that Paul goes, who are you, Lord? Who are you? And Jesus says this back to him. I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Wait a second. Let's think this through. Paul hasn't persecuted Jesus. Paul persecuted Christians and he attacked the church. No? Did I read that right? Okay. This is why you have to be careful about coming against God's people. Because when you come against God's people, it's not the people that you're coming against, it's him that you're coming against. And Jesus takes up a different approach to those that are persecuting you. My God, somebody ought to give God some praise in this house. What people don't understand is that they're not coming against us. So if you're hearing language like that in the world, people are coming against the church, they're coming against Christians, they're coming against this, they're coming against doctrine, they're coming against teaching, they're coming against this Holy Spirit, they're coming against tongues, they're coming against the gifts of God moving in the world, they're coming against that. They're not really coming against us, they're coming against Jesus. So Paul goes into Southeast Asia somewhere, studies for a little bit over two years. He's not playing. He is not playing, man. He's like, these, these attacks are real, and I'm going to go deeper so that I understand and I know how to operate. Look at what happens when Paul lays hands on them in Ephesus. They get the power of the Holy Ghost on them. They speak with other tongues, and they prophesy. To prophesy is not fortune-telling. To prophesy is not witchcraft. To prophesy literally means to set forth a matter. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon Paul and these people that are in this audience, they begin to take matters into a new arena. See the shift that's happening? They take it into a whole new arena. They started dictating their life by the word of the Lord rather letting God the life dictate how they were going to live. So we got to stop responding to what life throws at us and start responding to what's going to come out of our mouth as we dictate what the Lord has done in our life. Come on, somebody. You have the power of God living on the inside of you, supernatural power of God living on the inside of you, to set forth a matter. I'm telling you, you can set forth a matter in your own home. 
I declare and decree in the name of Jesus that my children will serve the Lord. I declare and decree that my marriage will be successful. I decree and declare today that no weapon formed against my family shall prosper. I decree and declare today that no weapon coming against the church of Jesus Christ will succeed. I am the head and not the tail. Come on, somebody. I have been anointed by the Lord Jesus Christ to allow the word of the Lord to be hurled out of my mouth to set forth a matter during this season. I decree and declare today that there are angels encamped around our government. That the spirit of the Lord is going to march through the halls of the White House. That the, through the Senate. I decree and declare that the spirit of the Lord is going to walk through the hallways of our school systems. In Jesus name. It's not in our name. It's in Jesus name. It's not in the church's name. It's in his name. Come on say it's in Jesus name. It's in his name. Come on. I'm blessed. I'm highly favored of the Lord. Through hell and high water, I'm going to serve the Lord. Though trials and tribulations are going to come, I'm going to de declare today that I'm going to be successful in this walk. I'm not going to live a depressed life even though depression tries to creep in. I'm not going to live a an anxious life because I know the worry is a sin. Come on, somebody. You have to let your day know that you're determining your day and your day is not determining you. <laughs> Circumstances come and go. But the Spirit of the Lord has given you the ability to know that you can operate in the raw power of God in a supernatural way. And everybody in this house said amen. Amen. Dan, I want you to come to this computer, this, uh, <laughs> this keyboard. Paul laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Two things happened. They were going to pray in the Holy Ghost, and they were going to prophesy. This week, we shifted out of summer into fall. D, I'm going to ask you to come, and I want you to help me this morning. I want every woman in this house to get on the left side and every man in this house to come on the right side. And before you leave today, I just want to lay my hands on you and agree that out of your mouth will come the raw power of God, that you will prophesy out of your mouth, that you will live a disciplined life so that you can come into another realm of operation. The assignment is on your life. To decree a certain thing, to set forth a matter. There are things that need to be set forth. And God has positioned you as a son and daughter to allow his word to be set forth out of your mouth. The power of God on your life. For this season right now that you're in. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.